<clears throat> Hello. Hello. Sound check. We're here. OK. Um, so here we are at the funding panel. Um, so we're going to start out. Uh, I just would like to take a quick poll here. So <clears throat> who here is a content developer? Wow. OK. How about people who are developing platforms specific to VR? You can be in more than one category. <laughs> and how about people who are developing um, hardware? Okay. Not so investors. How many other? And how many are investors? Sorry. Yep. Run away. Ah. Let people hands down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. <clears throat> so that gives us an idea. It seems like there is an abundance of content um, creators here, and we will discuss. Um, specific funding towards content. I think we all have our own kind of angle on that. Um, but let me start with a brief introduction, then we'll kind of go down the line. Um, so my name is Greg Castle. Um, I am a angel investor. Um, my background is in marketing. Um, originally, I've worked in corporate marketing for a couple different companies. Um, and then I was in the video game space starting in about 2010, working for a middleware company called Scaleform. Um, which is also where I worked with, um, with Brendan E. Reeb and Nate Mitchell and the rest of the founding Oculus team. Um, so <clears throat> they went on to do their thing. I kind of did my thing. Um, and one of the first investments that I made was in Oculus, um, which worked out quite well. Um, and si since then, essentially, I've been um, investing uh, across all sectors, but specific focus, I would say, on VR and AR. Uh, I'm Tim Merrill. Um, I'm a software engineer, investment banker, and lawyer, so I've got one honest profession. Um, I'm founder of a couple of companies. One's DigiCapital. Uh, we're an M&A advisor for AR and VR. The other is iTouch Reality, and we're developing AR and VR apps uh, at the utility and platform end. So I can talk from both the investor side, but also from the entrepreneur fundraising side. Hi, everyone. I'm Tipitat Chenavasan. I'm a VR investor partner at the Venture Reality Fund. So we're not just a VR fund, we're the VR fund. No offense. <laughs> but uh, some people know me as a developer, other people know me as a tilt brush artist. Uh, I just love VR and I want to make it great. Hey everyone, my name is Amit Mahajan. Uh, kind of short background. Uh, started off working at Epic on the Unreal Engine, on the Unreal Editor. Um, was there for a bit, uh, started two companies. First one was in social gaming, built a game called Farmville. Uh, that was acquired by Zynga in 2009. Little game called Farmville. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, uh, built a, another company that was focused on helping mobile app developers kind of take advantage of the mobile app platform. Uh, and so I ended up selling that and then started uh, Presence Capital, where a seed stage VR and AR focused fund. I've made about eight investments so far. Yeah, happy to chat. Cool. Um, so <clears throat> I guess that we can, we can start off by talking about um, kind of our investment thesis towards, towards VR. Um, so I think uh, yeah, I'll start, and then we can kind of, whoever can jump in. Um, I, I think that uh, as some of you guys might have been um, realizing platform and technology um, are a little bit easier for investors to wrap their head around than content necessarily. Um, and I think the reason for that is fundamentally um, platform and, um, and technology are, they're, they're kind of a bit easier. I think those who know content know those investments as slightly, um, you know, they're hit-driven businesses oftentimes. Um, and it's a little bit scarier for, for investors. Um, so now, <clears throat> actually, I should probably be speaking on behalf of myself. It's a little bit scarier for me. Um, <laughs> so, so, so when it comes to content, you know, it matters very much to me what the team is, what their track record is, have they brought a game to market beforehand. Um, and that's, you know, team plays a much larger part um, in those investments for me. Um, than, uh, than the other ones. Uh, from your guys' perspective, when it comes to content, how do you guys, how do you guys well, kind of see it? I think it helps to think about where the money's actually been going recently. If you look at, say, last year, there was around $700 million invested into AR and VR globally. Now, of that amount, it was led by, by video, 
um, and a lot of that video investment was into video platforms as opposed to video content. Games, and there it was more on the content side. Then, if you look more broadly, you look into investments into AR and VR uh, head mounted displays, so into, you know, core hardware. From there, it went, goes into solutions and services. So again, it's not exactly a platform play, but more in that direction. And then you move into advertising, where again, more platform-like than content-like. And from there, you move into some more of the, the other smaller areas. But back to what you were saying before, in terms of where the money's actually been going, it's been going more in the direction of platform, less in the direction of pure content. Um, and so speaking as a developer as well, we've been getting a whole bunch of inbound interest from VCs because what we're doing is at the, uh, at the utility and the platform end. And by the way, if there's any engineers in the room who are looking for a job, see me afterwards. Um, really. Um, but the, the reason we've been getting that interest, and it's, with us it's been coming from China, from South Korea, from the US and from Japan, is because there are a lot of guys who are really excited about what's happening with the market, with, the, with where it's going, and they know this is the next platform change. In terms of the investor way of thinking about things, when it comes to investing in content, you can do incredibly well, you really can, but the risk profile is quite different to most investors' risk profile. And so I think your point before is absolutely right, that you've got to be able to show an element of platform to what you're doing to get an investor, particularly a traditional VC, really excited. Tip, when you're looking at content, what, what kind of, what do you really look for in, a, sure. in an investment? So, I mean, again, the traditional answer from most technology VCs is we don't do content, not just because it's a hit-driven business, but how scalable is it as a business? But it does shift when there's new platforms, right? This is, again, the, the classic story of, like, you know, where Zynga, where Rovio, like, giants can be made when there's a transition. And so there's this opportunity, again, where content, for a certain extent, can be investable again. And we're, we're seeing a couple people get investment, but it's not because their content plays. A lot of times it's because of the resumes of the team. And you really have mm -hmm. to understand that. Where you're like, oh, hey, Google Ventures, they invest in resolution games. So they must be funding VR game studios, and VR game studios are fundable. No, 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 no. There's this man named Tommy Palm. He was part of King, responsible, uh, partially responsible for Candy Crush. He was very investable. And so if you have a billion dollar hit, it's very easy for you to raise additional money. But so on the other side though, what we do love about new platforms is really no one is an expert yet. So you could be two people in the Czech Republic just building something amazing, and you build something that's just so amazing that, that people can't like let it go, then you're on to something. And I think that's kind of a lot of what we're looking for. It's like, I, I kind of joke, but it is. Like we invest in what's great in VR and what will make VR great. And so you have to look at like where we are in the time, what, what's happening. We are in a content vacuum. Content needs to be so amazing that people keep to come back and back again to it. It can't just be good, it has to be great. And I think a lot of times when I meet people, content developers, they're like, oh, we have something, people are excited for it. And there's a lot of false positive where people are excited for VR because they've never tried VR and they try the demo. And I, I don't want, this happened to me a lot with some of the demos I was creating. And you have to learn to kind of understand how do you, what does it mean when you have something that's really great? And that means people want to keep coming back to it. They want to tell all their friends about it. Those are the signifiers, not just the, oh, that was awesome, man. It has to be like that compelling. And VR can be that compelling. So if you haven't hit that, keep making it awesome. So um, we, we've done a couple content deals so far, and it's almost entirely been on the strength of the team. Uh, we did one in Baobab, which is uh, an ex DreamWorks director and an ex VP from Zynga. Um, and Harmonix, which built Game Rock Band, and now they're doing that in VR. So, you know, a lot, a really strong track record. So definitely team, and that goes, by the way, just I'll just get that out of the way now. Team is like the most important thing when you're seed funding. So, um, you know, your background does matter, what you've built before does matter. That being said, like, you can get around that by having a really great, amazing demo, and that does count for a lot. Um, and to echo what Tipitat was saying, um, you know, when, even when you're, like, even in mobile, which is like an established platform, if you were to go and invest in content there, you, you, you don't just look at like, okay, is this game fun or is it good or whatever, you're looking for like, what are the engagement metrics, how it's gonna make money, how's it gonna support itself. Now, VR is interesting because you're at the early part of the cycle where there's not a lot of competition yet on the, on the platform. So there's opportunities where if you have something really cool and creative, it'll get a lot of attention very quickly. Um, you know, the guys at like Oculus and, and HTC and Valve, they, you know, they're, they're looking for great content and they, they, want to, they want to showcase that. Just like if you put out a really great app on the App Store back in 2008 when it first launched, yep. you would have gotten featured on, by Apple. Um, so so content's, you know, content's interesting. Um, and to talk a little bit about the business model there, uh, you know, the companies that are being funded, like 
like let's use resolution as an example. Um, they, you know, it's not just about building one title. It's not about like, I'm gonna invest in this one game and I hope to make money off this one game. It's they're building something bigger than that, right? So if you look at like Zynga, Glue, the, the, the kind of King, the big companies that came out of social and mobile, they were all, we were all, you know, they were all building kind of like not just one title, but a network of players. And what was valuable about those businesses wasn't like, okay, there's one, you know, really great game. It's that, you know, you have 10 million eyeballs every day across your entire network of games. And even as you're, you know, building more and more, uh, you're building new games, you're able to kind of move those people over to your new stuff and you have an audience that's, that's addressable. Eyeballs are very, very valuable. Uh, I think also, as, as you, I mean, a lot of folks out there who are doing content plays, I think one of the challenges for investors is, at the moment, if you look at the bulk of VR uh, content that's out there, there's a lot of experiences, um, which is both a good word and a bad word. Um, in the experiences, some people look at it and think that's fantastic, but an experience doesn't necessarily tra translate to what Tipitat was talking about, which is something which is compelling. So the folks in the room who are developing applications, so moving beyond entertainment, beyond games, beyond video, those sorts of compelling applications where people might use them 20 or 30 times a day, if you're doing something that's, that's that special, that's gonna get an investor really excited. If it's something where somebody will look at it and go, oh, that's beautiful, put it down and never look at it again, then for an investor, it's less interesting. And so if you can focus on something which looks more like an app, more like a platform, and pick, say, Next VR as an example. Tip and I, Tip and I were talking a few weeks back about with video, the, the way that sports video is one of, the, one of the areas where people look, will come back to it. And if, even if they're not sports fans, something to do with the movement, they just really love it. So if you look at Next VR and what they're doing, again, by focusing in on sports, they're a platform, they're in a content space, but they're not actually a content play. They're a platform play that's building a, a network and a community around content mm -hmm. with partnerships. So it's a very different angle, and that's why they're investable. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, quick, I can think- Can I just have one other thought? I, I, I think kind of going back, what we've been saying is, you know, again, as traditional VCs, we tend to invest in companies, not just a product, or not just like one piece of content. And a lot of people out here, you know, when you're talking about content, you're talking more about looking for content funding. And so there's different avenues now that are being started up to help support that. It's still a little tricky because the monetization quite, isn't quite there yet, so it's hard to understand how people get a return on this. But like- I have, I have one. So I helped start a company called Fig. Maybe some of you guys have heard of it. Um, Psychonauts 2 was just funded, uh, raised $3.8 million. That's a content play. Uh, Fig was started for this reason, um, and they are looking for VR plays. So definitely, if you guys are interested in getting funded for a specific title, you should take a look at Fig. Yeah, um, so... Kickstarter is also another example, but I prefer Fig. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask a question, then I'm going to give my answer, and then yeah. I'm going to ask answer. a question to so myself. I'm going to answer. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's well and good for us to say that when you've got a, you know, it is very much about the team, there's no question about that, and it is very much easier to fund a team that has had past successes. But there, I'm sure, are tons of people in the audience right now who maybe are first-time developers, who maybe don't have that track record. And so I think that it would be helpful to hear from us on what to do in that case. So. That was my question, and here's my answer. So, <laughs> I, I, I think it's a good question. <laughs> I, I think um, you know one thing that is, and and uh, Amit uh, touched on this before, um, but you know one thing that's happening now is that we're not that far away. I think you know beforehand um, you would look at you know you would look at a demo. You would hear abstract concepts about how the content was going to play out, hear about BD uh, deals that are in the pipeline, um, and you would kind you know, there was no facts to back it up, right? You would kind of have to take people for their word, and either you'd believe their story or you wouldn't believe their story. The truth is right now is that you actually can demonstrate traction. Um, and to Amit's point, um, the hardware manufacturers are dying for good content right now, and they have different programs that are set up to help get good content to the forefront. You know, it's kind of that cycle that was mentioned beforehand in the keynote. It's like, you know, if you succeed, they succeed. And so, um, you know, get some traction. Um, uh, do what you can with as little money as you can and show that people actually want your product. Um, that, to me, 
is you know, showing a, a, a substantial growth curve and really being able to demonstrate how powerful your product is um, through, through user interaction and things like that. You know, that, that is, to me, just as powerful as having somebody who ha has been on a team that's developed a great title beforehand. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd very much echo that. I mean, if you think about, say, um, uh, the, the head of content at Samsung is, is a friend. And with Samsung, you know, what, why are they doing VR? Why are they doing Gear VR? Well, they're, A, they're doing it because it, it's one of the next platform changes, but also it's going to sell them phones. To be able to get, uh, get that to work, you've got to have great content. So for folks who've got something which is, which is special, because it can't just be you know, good, it's got to be really great, then there are also some opportunities to go for, I guess, more non-traditional sources of funding, which might look a little bit more like a publishing deal, or it might look more like a, a marketing guarantee or a feature, where you might get the equivalent of you know, half a million of, of marketing space. Where, By the okay, way, that's yeah. a very, very good way to get your title funded. Like, in fact, a lot of times people come to us and ask, you know, will you fund this game? And I usually refer them to publishers or yeah. like, you know, Fig or whatever to try to, you know, give them alternative avenues. Um, and the thing is, that infrastructure is already there. The game industry has been using it for years. Exactly. Right? And so it's definitely, um, it's definitely an avenue if that's, if that's the right you want to go down. But the, the question you've got to ask when you do that is um, why you're doing it in the first place. In other words, if you could actually raise funding and do it by yourself, you're not tied to a publisher, you have more flexibility. If you can't, then you've got to ask, is the company that I'm going with going to give me freedom, or is it exclusive? If it's exclusive, is it big enough that I actually it's worth me tying my future to them for the next year or however long it is? So there are a bunch of different decisions. I mean, there are a bunch of agents that deal with that sort of stuff every day in the games industry. It's, it's not that different. Yeah, you should also negotiate for, for marketing as well, in yeah. addition, to, do yep. in addition yeah. to dollars. One of the biggest things that a publisher, especially a platform publisher, can give you is, is um, exposure. Yeah. OK. So, so, um, so bringing it uh, to the funding, slightly back to the funding, uh, I'm going to put tip on the spot. So what is the area that you are most excited about? What is the area that you think is most investable? And if you mention a particular company, that's OK as well. But you know, what, what really, what perks your ears up when you hear sure, about a sure, sure. particular uh, I mean, opportunity? I do think, because VR resets so much, everything in a way is investable in VR. Because again, we're talking about not just like you know, new content that needs to be created, but new ways to create this content, and also if you think about where VR is right now, we're still at like the Motorola brick phone of VR, mm -hmm. right? And so how, we, how do we make VR, you know, where we see it at? And, you know, I, it, it, there's almost too much the potential out there. But what I see is a lot of people kind of graduating towards the same kinds of ideas and not really digging deep enough into like what's going to be really valuable and not just novel. Joe Krauss from Google, Google Ventures always kind of brings this up, where it's like, don't go for the novelty, go for the value. Mm. And you know, Tim was kind of hinting at it too. But, but think about like, what are the hard problems that still need to be solved? Like, you know, right now, it's, if you read like, Upload VR and all the blogs, you know, they're all talking about positional tracking for mobile VR is something that you know, John Carmack is working very hard on. So if you're an impressive team of staff or PhDs that have solved that problem, then you should definitely you know, be out there doing something. But think about what other problems exist Right? Like, why isn't VR as good as it needs to be yet? And how do we bridge out? Or how do we make mobile VR closer to what, you know, uh, high-end VR is? Or you think about high-end VR, unlocking the tether. Like, who's doing really high, uh, you know, bandwidth wireless transmission for things like that? Like, those are really interesting. But then, at the same time, you know, I want to say in the content side, too, like, what are the types of games not waiting for 10 million people, but that will make 10 million people want to use this, right? Like, it's not like, I don't want to say killer app, but it's like the system drivers or the system sellers, right, that prove that this needs to happen. And so a lot of times when we talk to people, we're like, why in VR? What about this in VR makes it better? If it's a, you know, a lot of times we see these game companies or movie studios pitch us these ideas, and it's like, OK, it's slightly better in VR or, or, or slightly different, but is it transformative because it's in VR? Don't think about the games that we know or the movies that we know. Think about the ones that we don't know or haven't been able to tell because we've been limited by the frame or limited by the current technology. I mean, VR breaks away all of that. And so instead of relearning, think about going beyond that. Mm -hmm. I, I think we also mentioning the film space, it's a really interesting one to talk about. Um, we've been approached by most of the major Hollywood studios in the last six months about a range of things. But um, if you look at, say, Fox just did a deal with ODG, uh, you know, an AR company, not a VR company, 
um, Ralph Osterhout is, he's, Ralph Osterhout 69, and he would, he would exhaust most 18-year-olds. It's extraordinary. Um, uh, he actually did the submarines in the Thunderball film you know, a long time ago. Um, but the interesting thing about that partnership is when you look at the Hollywood studios, they're all really excited about VR and some of them about AR. But if you look at where the budgets are, what you see is that most of the money is not actually in the studios. Most of it's in the marketing departments. Because right now, for video, um, telling a linear story in a non-linear medium, you know, something at the beginning, middle, and end where the user can figure out what they're going to look at is really tough. But the budgets for films, is so, films are so large that actually the marketing departments have a large amount of cash to put toward things like the Martian experience. So again, if you've got something which is, say, in the video space, or something which, is, which could potentially relate back to something that Hollywood studios are doing, there are, there's actually money in their marketing departments and large amounts of money that you might be able to tap into. So if, you're, if your application or your content has the right sort of fit, and even if they're looking at it as a way of experimenting and dipping a toe in the water so they can talk to you and talk to the, the industry and understand what's going on, again, slightly more non-traditional, but it, there, there's money there to be, be had. So is that what excites you the most? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, what excites me the most are actually fundamental approaches to solving some of the t difficult problems. And I'll come back to Tommy Palm, who Tipitat mentioned earlier. I've known Tommy for ages. Um, uh, and what I love is with, with Resolution's first game, it was Solitaire, which doesn't get much more basic than that. And it's a Solitaire game, and they decided they weren't going to use the trackpad or the button on the gear. They were going to use gaze. But he had, Tommy had a problem. He wanted to have a button to reset the deck. But that would completely take away from immersion if you had a button hanging in midair next to the, the deck here in VR. So what he and the team decided to do is they would set the game in an old library. In the old library, there's an oak desk. On the oak desk, there's a button. If you look at the button, the deck resets. Now, it's a, it's a limitation of the hardware, and he's taken that and so gone, OK, that's a hard thing to deal with from a UI perspective. How can I design in an innovative way to deal with the limitations? And so for developers, who are developing games or whatever else, or other applications, actually figuring out novel approaches, new things, which aren't another iteration of Candy Crush or Clash of Clans. So you're doing something fundamentally different because you're limited by the hardware. That can be quite special if you get it right. That, cool. it's, it's those fundamental approaches that excite me. Amit? So uh, there's two companies in particular I'm looking for right now. If you've started either of these, contact me. Um, the first one is uh, creating in VR. So, you know, Tilt Brush is owned by Google, Medium is owned by Oculus. Can't invest in either of those. Um, but I think there is a massive opportunity to create effectively the Paint Shop Pro or the Kid Picks of, of VR. Um, and I think it's early days and people, it's one of those magical experiences the first time you try it, it's, it's, it's unique. Um, and I think you can then take that and build a much bigger business off of that. So that's, that's one area. Um, the second one is uh, productivity in VR. I think that the HMDs, the screens aren't, um, high res enough yet for, for text, so you can't like sit there and stare at like, you know, virtualized screens all day. But someday that's gonna be potentially a way, I, I'm sure a lot of people here took flights. Imagine sitting at the airport, you know, with a, a desk of monitors in front of you, which is your virtualized desk, and you're just getting work done, or on a plane, or whatever. So, um, and that's, those are hardware limitations, but you know, a lot of what we invest in is we wait, we, we invest in software early, because we believe software is portable and it'll grow with the hardware. Um, especially when we think about AR, it's the same way. Uh, you know, we're making a lot of AR bets when you can, you know, there's not even close to an AR device, uh, consumer AR device on the market. But we believe that a lot of the hard computer vision problems that, need, that are going to be core to the AR experience are being worked on today on mobile. Um, so we, we look at, for, we look at um, you know, in AR it tends to be a lot of computer vision stuff. In VR, verticalized applications, um, things that solve specific problems uh, or solutions. Uh, are all you know very interesting for us. Okay, we're running out of time here, so <clears throat> I just want to start um, from Amith again and, and work our way down. So, um, advice for startups that are thinking about which VC to potentially go to and 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 who to work with. Yeah, definitely. Aside from you guys, of course. So, so we see this a lot. So. Um, most, so I'll just give you some context on the deals we see to give you guys all data here, right? Like, most of the, the companies we look at, they're raising between, you know, 500K to 1.5 million, sometimes a little bit more. We tend to write check sizes of 100K to 500K. Our average check size is around 200K. Um, you know, the terms, in terms of valuation, they're all over. Last year, um, you know, they're pretty high. Uh, they're most, most, you know, equity um, funding rounds that we do, they're either safes or convertible notes. Um, 
and they tend to be between a $2 million you know, cap on valuation all the way up to $10 million cap on valuation. Higher than that, there's got to be a very good justification for us on why, on why you're going there, and we tend to prefer the lower end of that range. Um, so my advice is, is if you're raising a round, figure out what, figure out what problem you're solving. You know, ideally, you know, we always look for a demo 100% of the time, uh, just because VR is so technically intensive compared to uh, uh, other platforms. So we do look for a demo, um, and uh, you know, try to try, try to figure out your story of why this needs to exist in the world. And then when you're raising your round, try to be realistic about your valuation. Like you're, you know, the seed round when you're working with us tends to be like the first of many rounds you're going to do, um, and you kind of want to get the best people around the table. And sometimes if you set your terms too crazy or you're, you know, you're too aggressive, you know, you're, uh, you know, you're basically hurting yourself in the long run by not getting folks who, who can help you in the, long, you know, in the long run, help introduce you to you know, your follower rounds and so on. So that'd be my advice. Cool. So a couple of things I would say is, you know, if you're a first time founder, don't do it. Uh, go work at another great startup that just got funded, that's doing something significant in VR, build out your network, get to know more both investors and potential team members, founding partners, and really put in work. I know a lot of great game studios, you know, mobile game studios, social game studios, a lot of those guys had put in time at Facebook, understood that, you know, and that gave them a secret advantage when they went to start their own companies. You know, doing a startup is hard, doing VR is hard, conflating both of them makes it not just double hard, it makes it quadruple hard. Uh, but if, I, if that doesn't deter you, uh, the, the couple things is work with angels first. There, you know, there's a, a kind of way that this goes. Work with angels, work with you know, uh, incubator accelerator programs like uh, Boost VC, Rothenberg Ventures, River Program, or Super Ventures, or you know, if you're in Japan, the Tokyo VR Startups Program that I'm a mentor at. Uh, hey guys, konnichiwa. Um, and then go to VCs. And when you look and approach to VCs too, not all VCs are the same. Like VR covers so many things, right? You're like, oh, well they invested in a VR company. Well, no, 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 they invested in a medical company that happens to use VR. So don't go there pitching your VR game to them, right? Like it's like really, you know, understand what the different VCs and what they do and what value they can bring for you. Because a VC, it's not just about the money. I mean, we, we talk about this all, but VCs should help you a lot beyond that. Sure, um, I, I think do your research. Um, so if you look, there are broadly two camps of VCs and other investors in the market today. There are true believers. Um, then there are a lot of folks who are sitting on the fence to seeing what's going to happen this year in terms of installed base and where that's going to go. So there are a lot of folks you could talk to who will take meetings who won't give you a dime. So you could waste a lot of time. And an unashamed plug, uh, if you want a database of all the investment in the market for the last five years, go to digicapital, D-I-G-I-capital.com. There's one there. You can find out exactly who's putting money where and exactly which sectors. Cool. Um, yeah, my advice, very briefly, as we're out of time, um, would be to make sure that you're surrounding yourself with the best people possible, um, and people that you connect with, um, people who see things somewhat the way you do, but also, you know, that there's there's a healthy amount of, um, uh, you know, of, of uh, you guys seeing things differently as well. Um, it's just it's it's just so much about the people and uh, making sure that you're surrounding yourself with value-add people who know the industry, who've got good connections for you guys. Um, and I'll also say this, and this might sound a little bit biased coming from somebody who's on the investment side, but every successful entrepreneur that I know has never been crazy about the amount of has never they've always been generous with their equity and. What I, mean with, what I mean by that is I, I mean in terms of other people who are on the team, um, people who helped them along the way. Um, I think that they saw the long term much more and at the end of the day, if everything goes according to plan, you should have a good amount of money that whether or not it's a couple of percentage points one way or the other isn't really going to make or break you. What is going to make or break you is the fact that you've surrounded yourself with a team of super dedicated people who are knowledgeable who help to get you where you need to go. Um, and that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed the session. I hope it was useful. We'll be outside. Thank you very much. Thank you.